Previously on Loving the Alien. We studied clubbing in Berlin. Partying every Saturday night. Doing a, a, a spontaneous street party with a ghetto blaster. And there was a lot of really cool records. And it was all about the music. It was strictly about the music. I remember that in a time very... No, I remember my authentic, my authentic. I think we all had the best time of our life there. For me, it was a liberation. It feels like yesterday, but it's actually... 18 years ago now, which is crazy. Greetings, Earthlings. My name is Steel5000, and I welcome you to our third season of Loving the Alien. To celebrate our third Earth year transmitting, we'll be doing a special episode with not one, not two, but three aliens. Each has their own story, though they happen to overlap here and there. From growing up in the Midwest of North America to being some of the original gangsters of the Minus crew, Earthlings, allow me to present to you the bosses of items and things. Magda, Mark Hull, and Troy Pierce. Magda, you moved to Detroit when you were nine years old. What are your first impressions of the Motor City? When I first arrived in Detroit, I pretty much cried because it was the ugliest place I've seen. And we arrived in the winter, and coming from Texas, where I lived for two years, it was shocking. And I didn't really appreciate it until I became a teenager. And what about you, Troy? You are from exotic Indiana. How did you pass the days as a young boy? I didn't really do much there. I skateboarded a lot, actually. That's really all I did. When did you fall in love with techno? Not till later. Like, I just, I didn't really, like, electronic music in general, I wasn't, not that I wasn't aware of it, I just didn't, I guess I wasn't aware of it, maybe. Like, maybe not till, I'd say, 93, I guess. According to my sources, you and Magda were residents at Richie Horton's legendary club, 13 Below. Legendary. <laughs> Is it legendary? <laughs> so says the internet. <laughs> Were you DJing back then? No, it's like I wasn't playing techno or anything like that. It was, you know, like it wasn't a big club. It was the smallest kind of bar. And we had a special party, me and my friend Scott, where at the beginning of the night, we'd bring all our Ataris and ColecoVisions and any video games we had at home. And we'd set them up like Pong in that corner, Coleco in that corner, Atari over there. And um, we had a big box of all the cartridges. So people would come and we'd play the music all night, DJing like um, like some New Order or Kraftwerk or something, like doo-doo music, electro. And people would play the games and like bring the cartridges up to switch them. And so we'd talk to them like, oh yeah, I just played Mr. Do, it's so good. I'm like, oh cool. And so it was like, it was like that kind of thing. It wasn't like a, a dance party. It was more like a video game. A video game party. Yeah. In 1994, you moved to New York City, where you would later begin your DJ career. Tell us about those early days. Yeah, I kind of started buying records before I moved to New York. And then when I moved to New York, I didn't, uh, I lived by my, I didn't have any friends. Not that I didn't have friends there, but I moved there by myself. I didn't know anyone. And I lived really close to um, two really good record stores in New York. So I just was really, I got really lucky that they were like really two blocks from my, from the apartment that I lived. And I'm living by myself, so it's like, what am I gonna do? Go to the record shop and go back to my place and try to learn how to play records. Really, that's how it happened though. And I, it would have been different if I would have, maybe it would have been faster if I had friends there. And later, I got friends and became friendly with people. But when I moved there, I moved there by myself, you know? That's my point that I'm trying to make poorly. Magda, you were DJing way before jumping into production. What sparked your interest to get into the studio? Uh, Mr. Mark Hool, actually. Um, I moved across the border to Canada um, and lived with him for a while. And he had a massive studio with all kinds of synths and interesting gadgets. So, yeah, he started teaching me um, basic concepts and I just started messing around and we tr tried to make some music together so that was pretty funny. 
Later on, you moved to the Big Apple where you started the chill and weave parties. What are your memories from those nights? Uh, the gel and weave parties. Interesting memories, definitely. Um, I, be I guess that was the around the time that I discovered German minimal music, such as Perlon, and started doing this party in a very small bar. Um, but there were these dancing laws. So basically, you're not allowed to dance. So of course we did, but we, I had a red light in the booth, and every time the police came in, the light went off. So I had to stop, and everyone had to stop dancing. It was crazy. It was like footloose. Mark, why do you think in today's world, DJs also need to be producers? Huh, how do I do this diplomatically? Well, I mean, I think a DJ should get into like making music or something. If, you know, if you're just a DJ playing other people's stuff and going, yeah, look how great I am, like playing other people's music, like really, like it's not like there's too much involved with DJing these days, like everything's locked in and it's like, skill-wise, music selection, there's so many places where you can just get a top 10 list. So I think you have to, you know, take things a little bit further, like start doing your own edits or, yeah, like maybe do a couple productions. I don't think you have to release stuff, but I think you should be wanting to get more involved, you know? You shouldn't just be like, oh yeah, I'm a DJ, I'm gonna download some songs and play them. You should wanna, hey, I wanna learn about drum machines and stuff like that, maybe incorporate it. And yeah, then I have like complete respect for those people. But it's the ones who just like download stuff and go, look at me, I'm great, like, yeah. You along with Richie and Magda were one of the early pioneers using Tractor and Final Scratch. How has this technology affected your style? Hmm, I don't know, good question. I don't have to carry records, that, I guess that, but that doesn't affect my style. Um, I think in the beginning I liked it because I could play uh, my music or edits of things. I could play different things that we made, not rely, didn't have to be a record, you know? That's what I really liked about it in the beginning. So maybe in that sense, how it changed my style was I was able to play more, a wide range of things or different things that other people couldn't play because they didn't play like that, <laughs> you know? But then people start playing CDs. I always forget that part, that you could have put it all on a CD. I skipped that CD playing part. I didn't even know how to play the CDs. Last night at Goa, I saw that you were DJing with two X1s, a machine, and an even tied stomp box. Can you please talk about your setup? I use Tractor and Ableton together and do some drum programming with the machine. And, and I like the outboard effects, that Eventide box, just because it's kind of hands-on and different than using the internal effects of Tractor. I don't really ever use those, to be honest, because it's like anyone can use them, kind of, you know? Big reverb washes, and it's not, it's nothing that you couldn't hear someone else do, you know, so. Mark, can you please talk about the MIDI controller you use to play live? That controller is a um, controller that I made with Livid, Livid Instruments in Texas. I took one of theirs that they had and I brought it in Photoshop and I was just like copying, pasting buttons like all over. And then we gave it to them and then, yeah, like a, a couple months later, there was some a package and the, it was there. Like, Wow. What was in Photoshop became like reality. The only thing is that when you have your own special controller and something breaks, you can't just go to the store and like get a new one now. So I have to, you know, like like the other night I broke three rotary things on because I was going to. So now unfortunately I have to find a couple days off where I can take it and get it repaired and stuff like that. So it's it's more work, but it's more rewarding and it's exactly what I want. You know, it's exactly it's my baby kind of thing. Yeah. My baby. Troy, what's your current setup in the studio? Everything now is really nice in my place and I'm happy with everything. But it's like, I think I got more things done when I had less. Do you know what I mean? When there's one drum machine, it's like, that's all I have. So, okay, great. Everything is going to come from that and it's fine. Now it's like there's three drum machines and three effects things and all this other crap and it's like, it's too confusing. Mental overload. It's like if you have 17 books to read, you don't read any of them. You're like, oh, I want the two pages from that. I really love the index of this one. And you don't do anything. <laughs> in theory. <laughs> For me personally, maybe other people in the room work differently. Is that you, Magda? <laughs> I'd like to experiment. Yeah, I mean, I have a nice studio now that I'm happy with, with uh, gadgets I like. And so 
Just let them run and see what happens, and it's fun that way. What's your favorite piece of gear? The Eventide H8000, definitely. Um, it's an effects unit, it's just crazy. You can do anything with it, it sounds so warm. Mark, I know you're an analog synth wizard. I'm not a wizard, but I do love them, yeah, for sure. What was your first piece of equipment? Uh, the first one was, I think, like a little Casio. It was a Casio with a drum kit on it, like some drum pads, so I could like like play with the, the drums with one hand and like do -da -do -da -do -da -do -da -do and that was a lot of fun. And then I got a JX3P that was like I think my first professional synth with a little PG200, and it was nice. I mean, it was analog. It still had a lot of presets on it, so it was easy. You didn't have to ju just do everything from scratch. And yeah, just playing along with that, recording lots of songs with that, making tracks after tracks, made me want to get more and like make more sounds and stuff. So I think that one was the first one that really hooked me. Like, And the last one? I don't know, I don't think I got anything recently. Did I? I don't know. But there is a bunch of new synths coming out though that I want to check out. Like there's the Arturia yeah. Mini Brood. It looks like it's like a SH-101. It looks like it might be cool, but I'm scared that it's not going to have any personality. It's just going to be like a, a boring sounding synth, but you know, I'm, I'm anxious to try one. It's really cool right now because so many companies are releasing like small, like, like the Tetras or something or the Mofos, like small analog synths. Like it's, it's all back now. You can get like an MFB drum machine like this or like it's, it's really cool. Like for, the, for a live person like me, it's so much easier to have like a whole bunch of small stuff all over than bringing like giant racks of synths like, like the olden days. Magda, how is your new album coming along? I didn't know I had a new album coming along. <laughs> no, I'm just uh, I'm just working on various things right now. Um, did some remixes, and I wouldn't say I have an album in particular, but I, I want to record different things, different sounds. See what we see what comes of it. If there's an album, great. If not, we'll just do an EP. In you, Troy, any plans of an upcoming album? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, I no. It's too many things to do. I don't know. It's too overwhelming for me personally. You know, I would like to finish four things. An EP is fine with me. Mark, what takes you longer, to make dinner or a track? Dinner. <laughs> dinner takes longer. Yeah, I like slow cooking, like taking my time, sauces and stuff. But a track can be like five minutes, and that's why right now. When you make a track, what's your first move? I don't have a first move. It's always like an exploration for me or an experimentation when I make tracks. Like I don't, ooh, I'm gonna make a song now. It's just fooling around, like playing, like what if, what if. So maybe sometime I have a, a VST open and I'm doing something like that. Or sometimes I'm on like the 808 sending triggers somewhere. Like it's, it's not a formula. It's not the same thing over and over again. Your sound has been described by you in past interviews as dark and spooky with a splash of funk. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure that I said that? Most certain. I don't know the, the sounds that I gravitate towards. I don't know. Mark gravitates towards cartoon. I don't know. Like, and I gravitate towards, I don't know, graveyard, I don't know, the weird stuff. And what does Magda gravitate towards? Prince. We've already determined that that's, she's, she's Prince and I'm industrial. What? Don't be mad. Corner Bread. A fairly new project between you and artist Daniela Huerta. Please, talk to us about this collaboration. We just wanted to do something more eclectic. Um, I, I, have, I love a lot of different types of music um, and sometimes people just know me for um, what I play in the clubs but um, I think me and Daniela really work well together and so we decided just to start uh, doing a podcast series um, and we just released the third one on Okini and um, yeah it's nice I really like this project because I get to really dig deep for some old post-punk or weird French new wave um, and also some experimental stuff so it's it's fun do you plan on releasing original tracks together? Yeah, we talked about it, definitely. Uh, we did some stuff in the studio already, so... Yeah, it would be nice. Items and things? Sure. Is the internet our friend or our enemy? 
Yeah, you know what, never be, I think you should never be afraid of technology or information. It's always a good thing, like the more that's out there, the better life is. And yeah, sure, people can use it for bad, but think about the opposite, you know? Living in the dark, it'd be even far worse, I think. How is life after Minus? Do you miss Richie? I see him a lot more than I used to, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Um, no, it's been it's been good. Uh, we focus on items and things, and he's been doing his thing. Um, I've played in Ibiza for the Enter parties the whole summer, so I've actually seen him more than I more now than when I was on Linus. To wrap up this trifecta interview, I'd like to know: producers sending demos to items and things, what should they have in mind? Um, nothing in particular, actually. I don't want people to. Um, think they have to send us the sound that they think we represent. I, I like getting new stuff or things that is different, actually, that doesn't sound like what we released. Well, that brings us to the end. Oh, that's it? Yes, Troy. Oh, Thank you all so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Steel5000, and this was Loving the Alien. <laughs>